now for something completely different. I've been really enjoying some of these presentations uh, and thinking to myself, let's go back in time and get completely analog. I am like the most low-tech person you'll probably see today. Um, I'm a game designer, as uh, uh, Justin mentioned. I run a research lab here called Pet Lab, also mentioned. But what is interesting to me about games is that they are super ancient. They've been around forever. Um, these dice, uh, which we use kind of in a plastic form for Monopoly or a variety of other games, are about 5,000 years old. They're probably one of the oldest technologies we still use in the same form today, uh, along with the wheel and maybe a couple other things. Um, and what's interesting to me is uh, on the left, there's a sort of image from the Lascaux Caves, uh, cave painting. Um, the idea of telling stories with, with, with images or with words. And storytelling and gameplay have kind of existed alongside each other to help us make sense of the world. We often talk about narrative and stories, and I think it's something that's a comfort zone for a lot of people in new media or in marketing, advertising, and some of these other fields. But games is something that I think a lot of people feel some discomfort with. Actually, how many of you, can I ask you to raise your hands if you are a gamer, if you would describe yourself as a gamer? Yeah, OK, there's like seven of you out there. Um, I mean, I think one of the big problems is that term, right? Gamer. It sounds like maybe you spend a lot of time in your basement eating Doritos, drinking Red Bull, or Rockstar, or one of those kinds of energy drinks. So I think games now have kind of a, a bad rap, right? But ultimately, not only do you all play games or have you in your lives, but you also are all game designers. If you think back to that class you took in game design when you were young, recess, you can kind of remember when you used to sort of take games, modify them, change them, do new things. Um, and I think that's a really important part of your development as a person, as well as understanding how systems work. So, so that's my spiel, basically, is that I think games are a really exciting form. Um, you know, the video game form has only been around for about 52 years. And uh, they're beginning to mature. There's a lot of great new games out there. And in fact, with WNYC, uh, for my Geek of the Month talk, you can find that online and you'll see the 10 or 11 games I recommend you play because I think they're really interesting. And there's an indie game scene that's sort of burgeoning and doing great things. Of course, Minecraft comes from the indie game scene. One person made it and then sold it for $2.4 billion last week to Microsoft. Um, my inspiration actually comes from a, a movement called the New Games Movement. Uh, Stuart Brand was part of this. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Whole Earth Catalog. That was something that he worked on. Um, Bernie DeCoven is my, like, the patron saint of play <laughs> for me uh, and uh, co-wrote some of these books, uh, the New Games books. If you've ever played with a parachute in school, that was part of New Games. Um, this was a movement in the 70s. It was actually a response to the Vietnam War. Uh, and so used military technology like parachutes and subverted those technologies through play. So for me, games have this subversive potential as well, which I think is really misunderstood and uh, kind of great. Um, so games are kind of a training ground for learning systems, and they also provide us with the opportunity to play and be subversive and really think about very serious ideas, but in ways that are playful and social and collaborative. So I run this research lab, Pet Lab. I'm also, I have a company called Local Number 12, the Union of Design and Play. Um, with Local Number 12, I'm working on a card game called the Meta Game, where you have conversations about different aspects of culture from Pride and Prejudice to any Journey album. Um, and you compare them and have discussions about which feels like first love. Who thinks Pride and Prejudice feels like first love? Raise your hands. Let's see what kind of audience we have. Uh, okay, how about any Journey album? 
Oh man, yeah, you guys, I think Glee, maybe you're Glee fans. And <laughs> in Pet Lab, we do a variety of different projects. We have funding from a variety of different foundations. The Knight Foundation gave us some funding to work on a project called Data Toys. We were really looking at how, instead of information visualizing, what happens when you can create information playification? Um, not gamification, but make information playful, turn it into a toy, so that we can begin to understand it by kind of pushing and playing with it. This is actually a, a, a project that we did with um, Public Radio International and uh, the Immigration Policy Institute about immigration. Uh, so you had these different dolls and you could put different heads on them and press them against your device and see how well they would fare in different cities around the nation if they were immigrating. I do a lot of non-digital game design. Um, this is budget ball. It's a physical and fiscal sport about the federal debt played between college students and members of the White House and Congress. <laughs> college students will have won every tournament so far. Um, and it's a game that uh, involves sort of playing, uh, uh, getting goals, um, it's team sport, and in between play periods, you actually uh, purchase power-ups, like get an additional defensive player or something like that, but to do that, you're going into debt, and to get out of the debt, you have to take sacrifices, like wear an oven mitt and hold the egg, and if you drop it, you lose a player. So there's a variety of different... The idea of it is... is First, to create a spectacle on the National Mall every year so that people are like, wait, what's this about? Oh, it's about the federal debt. Interesting. But most importantly, it's to create awareness among undergraduates nationwide about the fact that they will be paying off our debt um, and how it feels. So just to let you know when you're playing the game, it feels great to go into debt. Nothing feels better. You can do more. It's a power-up, right? and it feels really bad to try to get out of it. It's a total, it's like tighten your belt and uh, literally, you know, it's how we might feel if we have to pay more taxes, which ultimately will probably happen. Uh, another game, uh, Reactivism, is a game about activism and it recreates moments of activism as well as sort of teaches certain skills about coordination and, and uh, citizen journalism using cell phones. Uh, it's been played in New York. It was first launched at the Come Out and Play Festival here in New York City, which is a great festival. You gotta go next summer if you're here in the city. Um, and it's been played in Philadelphia, Atlanta, um, Beijing, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. So it's a kind of a history game, but also one that involves kind of putting yourself out there and learning how activists actually do things. Finally, this is a shot from uh, Boys and Girls Clubs. We created the curriculum for the Boys and Girls Clubs in game design. Um, happy to say it's their most popular one. Um, there are five million members of the Boys and Girls Club uh, around the world, so we're really excited. I, I can't remember exactly how many people have done the um, curriculum, but it's in the hundreds of thousands. And the thing about teaching game design that I really like, especially with young people, is to teach this process that they don't necessarily learn in school, maybe in recess, but it's this idea of the iterative process. So to conceptualize, have an idea, prototype it, play test it, put it out there, see what happens, and then change it, right? So in the classroom, if you take a test, you take it once. You fail, that's it, that's the end. But with games and with design, right, failure is the beginning. It's how we learn um, what to change, what to improve. So I really love teaching this process because I think it's also not just about games and making games, but it's a kind of life skill that I think is important. Game design also doesn't only teach you know, how systems work because games in themselves are systems, right? They're like the pop cultural form of systems. Um, but also they teach you for the first time, for many people, that other people think differently than you do, right? And they're not really playing it wrong. It's the system that you designed, um, and you need to work on improving that. So, and then finally, I'll just talk briefly about how we're bringing this process of 
game design into another context. This is Games for a New Climate. Uh, it's a project that we're doing with the uh, American Red Cross and also the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. Um, this is a beautiful image of Uganda where we've tested the project. We've been to a variety of different countries, Vietnam, Uganda, Senegal, Namibia. This is me playing a local game um, that involves rhythm. And I have to say I'm very, a very good dancer, so it worked out fine. <laughs> no, actually, I was, I was terrible at this game. Um, but the, the, the funny thing is that whenever we go into a community, we're making games to create awareness and, and planning around disaster preparedness. So this is, a, this is a location that actually deals with a lot of mudslides, uh, resulting in increased rains from climate change, OK? And they're dealing with like pretty bad, you know, life-threatening repercussions of this on an annual basis. Um, so what we do, instead of making games to bring there, um, we've been now uh, going, playing local games, and designing games with the community. So the most important thing about uh, any of this is to go in and play those local games. Because what that ends up doing is it levels the playing field. No longer are we the important Red Cross people kind of coming in, um, but we're people who just can't play these games very well and look like total idiots, which seems to be a nice icebreaker um, for everyone. And playing together is a great way to establish trust. Here are a couple of other games uh, played locally. I, I've learned about 10 different versions of Mancala now uh, from different villages around Africa. Um, and I think... I mean, I can show you a little bit. This is one of the games that we created uh, called Ready, which involves um, identifying things that you want to get prepared, like food security or uh, digging uh, pit latrines, how difficult they are, and then you kind of race around and throw dice and, and uh, uh, complete those tasks. We have other games that involve singing, <laughs> which wouldn't go over so well here, but goes over great um, in some other places where people aren't as embarrassed about singing in public. Um, so yeah, we've learned a lot through this project. We've learned a lot of local games. We've also learned a lot um, ourselves in reflecting on the game design process, how to make it accessible, and how to use it in a way that will help communities come together, collaborate, uh, no longer play these sort of hierarchical roles, but sort of on an even playing field. Make plans for the future. So in the games, a lot of the things that are involved is sort of planning what the kinds of things you want to encourage are in the game. Um, and uh, ultimately address really serious issues with a little bit of fun and levity and uh, playfulness. So that's what I've been up to. Thank you all.